Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. We need to see that in order to understand the truth of God, we have to be a new creation. We have to be illuminated by the Holy Spirit, seeing things from His standpoint. And one of the greatest resources that God gives to us in order that we can discern His will is His commandments. Now, that's going to be emphasized in our study today because... It was so important to God that his children, his covenant people, that they would receive his commandments that even though Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, he broke the first set of commandments, we see that God is going to bestow upon Israel and pay great attention to how this event unfolded. What were the circumstances of this re-giving of the law of God. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Exodus and Exodus chapter 34. The book of Exodus and chapter 34. Now, I mentioned to you last week that, that this section is read in a special way during the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Tabernacles. We only read a portion of what is read on these holidays. But this evening, we're going to read the second part, and I want us to see before we begin the correlation between what we studied last week and what's happening this week in chapter 34. Now, I've already said, you already know, chapter 34, God re-gives, that is, a second time, the commandments and we see last week and I hope that you have paid attention that over and over and over last week what was emphasized that Moses had found grace now how we can understand that is this that Moses had secured grace from God and that changed everything about him his identity the purpose of his life, and the ability to draw near to God and experience God. And we see an inherent relationship, and don't miss this, between receiving God's grace and what's happening now, receiving the commandments, the law of God. So Exodus 34, beginning with verse 1, we read, And the Lord said to Moses, Carve out, you shall carve out, and it can be carved out for yourself, two tablets of stone as the first ones. Now, this is a very significant phrase because these tablets, they are going to be carved out, and the word here shows that this has a spiritual purpose. This same word is used in making the pagans a pagan image or statue. And what we glean from that is this. When one behaves in this manner, carving out something, it's going to have spiritual implications. And over and over we see in the Word of God these two poles, that which is good, that which is evil. That reflects darkness, that reflects life or light. That which reflects death, that which reflects life. That which reflects blessing, that which reflects cursing. So these poles, these great differences. And here we see that it is going to reflect a spiritual outcome that is pure, that is holy, that is in congruency with the expectations of God. And this is something that's so important 
that we pursue the expectations of God, that our prayer should be beseeching God to know what his expectations are and not us supplicating him with our expectations, what we want. So we read here, the Lord said to Moses, carve out for yourself two tablets of stone as the first ones. And I, this is God speaking still, and I will carve or I will write, and the word can be inscribe. I will inscribe upon the tablets, the words which were upon the first tablets which you broke. Now, this is not a criticism. This reminds us of why Moses broke them. And that is because Israel began to play, and the implication is, play the harlot. Move away from fidelity with the God of Israel. And they fell into idolatry. We're going to see, and I realize that, that many people struggle with what the Bible reveals. For example, in the book of Revelation chapter 14, we had the second time that this group, 144,000, is mentioned. And this group in Revelation 14, it's unique. We do not see the same description about the 144,000 from chapter 7. Now, they have something in correlation. That number, 144,000, relates, relates to a kingdom people a people that God has a covenant with. But in chapter 14, we see that these 144,000, they are unique. They follow the Lamb, that is Messiah, wherever He goes. And they are virgins. And what does that mean? Well, it means that they have not played the harlot, that they have not done that which is idolatrous and many people say well that's a stretch they want to interpret this as virginity in the physical sense rather than virginity in the spiritual you see virginity in the spiritual is fidelity to God being faithful honoring this covenantal relationship where adultery spiritually is idolatry and we're going to see tonight in our study that God uses over and over playing the harlot adultery in a spiritual context. In fact, most of the time prophetically and in the Torah that God speaks about adultery, he's referring to idolatry. That's something that we should not just, just cast aside, but that we should realize when we study the book of Revelation. So God says here about how Moses discerning the spiritual condition that they were in the flesh. When you're in the flesh, the Torah has no relevance. So Moses broke it. And now we're going to see that there's going to be a change in this passage. The giving of the law is going to be related to the spirit. And that's why Paul says, and this is why we read it as our call to worship, that the law, not for the carnal one, not for the one who is fleshly, not for the one who is in idolatry, but the law is for the spiritual one. And the one who walks in the spirit is going to fulfill, demonstrate the righteousness of the law. And the outcome of that is the glory of God being manifested. Move on to verse 2. God is speaking still to Moses about this, this call to receive the commandments a second time. And he tells him in verse 2, and be prepared. Now, the word here is the word nachon. It is a word of being established. And it has to do with something that brings about stability being something that puts you in a correct condition. So we see that the children of Israel, they did not heed God's preparation in, in chapter 19. 
and it manifested their sin, the lack of preparation in chapter 20 of this book of Exodus. But Moses is going to be different. Moses is going to be ready. He's going to be prepared. He's going to be in a correct spiritual condition. So God says, be correct for the morning. And you shall go up in the morning to Mount Sinai. Now, notice the giving of the commandments took place upon a mountain top. When you're on a mountain top, you see things differently. There was a change in his location. And we see that there's a connection between the law and a change in location. When I am pursuing the truth, let me say that another way. When I am pursuing the expectations of God, by doing that, I will be relocated where God wants me to be. Where I can receive revelation and take that revelation and utilize it for the things of God. So Moses is going to go up on, in the morning in light, illumination, morning time is illumination. You go up in the morning on Mount Sinai, and you shall stand to me. Now, this is important because this is also understand as of me. It is a word that speaks of great intimacy between Moses and God. So you will be stood, that's literally what it means. You will be stood to me. And then there's a word, sham, there. And what the rabbis tell us is that this word, which we tend not to put too much emphasis on, simply the word there, but it is a very, very, very significant word. You would be wise. It would be a great use of your time to see everywhere in the Bible that the word there, and you need to check it out in the Old Covenant, that is in the Hebrew Bible, every time the word sham appears. Because sometimes the word there in English is written, but it's not this word. So we need to make sure it's this word sham. It is emphasized throughout the scripture. Once more, and you shall stand to me there upon the, the top of the mountain, verse 3. Now, Moses, because he prepared himself, because of the calling on his life, because of Moses' commitment to the things of God, he's the one that's being summoned to this mountaintop experience. No one else. In fact, look at verse 3. He says, a man shall not go up with you. Also a man, he shall not appear, he should not be seen on all my mountain. Not just on the top, but not at all on the mountain. And also the flock and the cattle, they shall not uh, be pastured. That is, they shall not graze, they shall not be fed uh, before that mountain. So nothing but Moses there. And all of this does is to show, to emphasize God's call upon the life of Moses. And it's that call that gives Moses authority. This description here speaks to the uniqueness, the powerful call, the authority that God is entrusting Moses with before the people. Verse 4. And he will carve out, or literally, he carved out, this is Moses, two tablets of stone as the former ones. And then it says, he went up early. Who's that? Moses. Moses went up early, getting up early. That shows priority. Moses got up early in the morning, and he went up to Mount Sinai. And this is a very significant expression. Just as the Lord had commanded him. That's how we should behave. Doing the things, behaving just as, and we should underscore that word, just as. It's one word in Hebrew. 
just as the Lord commanded us. That's what we should do. And when we do that, we're going to see that God works to bring change. God moves us unto Him. And we are equipped to carry out the purposes of God. Verse, verse 4, the last part. And He took, this is still Moses, and He took in His hand the two tablets of stone. Verse 5. Now, as Moses responded to the word of God and it's only after Moses responded he prepared himself he carved out those two tablets of stone and he obeyed by moving up to that mountain it was when Moses put into action the instruction of God then God responded then God moved and we see that in verse 5 and the Lord came down in a cloud, and this is important. There is, according to the scholars, a correlation between this cloud, Anan, and the Spirit of God, the manifestation of God, the anointing of God, all these things that should come into our mind when we speak about the Holy Spirit. And there's an emphasis upon this cloud, now, why is that? Well, remember our call to worship. Where Moses, excuse me, where Paul says that the law is spiritual. And if you're not in the spirit, the law won't profit you. The law will simply tell you that you are a sinner. But if you're walking in the spirit, if you find yourself in the midst of the spirit of God, then... The law is going to be relevant. It is going to have purpose in your life. We read, And the Lord went down in a cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed, this is a word, to call out in the name of the Lord. Now, what is name synonymous with? Character. So this cloud that went and stood itself there with him with Moses we see a manifestation of this spirit with the character of God this is important it is the purpose of the Holy Spirit to manifest the name the character of God in our life and it's only when we're in the spirit that we're going to be able to be recipients of of the moving the equipment of God Verse, verse 6, and the Lord passed his presence, this is the word face, he caused his face to pass, and notice what it says. We move into a very significant section. Now, this is known in Judaism as the 13 attributes of God. Why 13? Biblically, 13 is a good number. It relates to God, who is one, and the people, the people of God, the 12 tribes, 12, the people of God. So 13 speaks about unity between humanity and God, the people of God and God himself. And this is the foundation of what this passage is about. Do we want the unity of God in our life? And notice how God, these 13 attributes, what they are. Verse 6, the Lord caused to pass his presence. And he proclaimed, the Lord proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, the God who is merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in loving kindness or steadfast love or grace it's that word chesed that same word that we emphasize so much and then finally in verse 6 we see the word truth i want to say that again let's read it in hebrew first vaikra b'shem adonai and it says vaikra hashem hashem el rachum vechanun Erech apaim vevrav chesed va emet. Once more, 
he proclaimed, this is God, the Lord, the Lord, God of mercy and grace, long-suffering, abundant in grace and in truth. Verse 7. Notzer chesed le elefim. The word notzer, it's the same word that the city of Nazareth is named after. Realize, and we get so many emails concerning this, about how people believe that Yeshua was a Nazarene based upon the Nazarite vow in the book of Numbers. No, there's no connection between that word, the Nazarene vow, being a Nazir, and the word here, Notzer. The word Nazir has to do with a, a commitment made, but Yeshua. He was from the city of Nazareth. It is different between a Z and a TZ, or between a Zine and a Sade, the Hebrew letters. And this word, Notzer, means to keep, to guard. It is a synonym of the word, and many of you know this word, Lishmor, to keep, to guard. So we see in this scripture, God promising something. Look again at verse 7. God keeps, he guards grace. Grace for a thousand. And through this grace that God keeps, it says, he lifts up iniquity and transgression and sin. But we see something else about him. Notice the next part. Ve nake lo yinake. The word, here is the word clean, and it tells us. Yes, God is gracious, but there are some that he cleans, and there's some that he will not clean. And what is the outcome of that? What's the reason for that? It's grace. It's whether one is experiencing God's grace, and how do you experience that grace? You beseech God. That is why his name was proclaimed twice. Lord, Lord, it's an emphasis of his character. Lord is the transcendent name. It is above all. And what does God emphasize about his character? He's merciful. He's forgiving. He's gracious. And he does that to the thousands. But keep reading. We also find he visits for those who he does not clean. Those who are not recipients of his grace because they did not seek it according to his truth. He will visit, that is punish, the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children until the third, third and the fourth. And the implication is the third and fourth generation. Now, how do we understand this? Well, it's not that if the father sins, that his children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren are going to be punished because of what he did. That's not what the Word of God is saying. We need to see that, that sin is genetically rooted. Why am I a sinner? Because my father is, my grandfather. Going all the way back to who? All of our fathers, Adam, the first man. And because the first man sinned, we're all sinful. But here's what the scripture is saying. There is a passing on of a sinful tendency specific in a behavior. So if I'm a thief, that tendency to steal is going to be passed on to the third, maybe to the fourth generation. So that is the implication here of what he says about visiting the sin, the transgression, the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. That sinful tendency specifically, whatever it might be, is passed on genetically and it will manifest itself. So that's why we need to be so concerned about guarding ourselves so we don't have an unrighteous influence upon the generations that follow after us. Verse, verse 8. Moses, by Maher, quickly. 
Moses moved quickly and he bowed towards the ground. This word speaks of his head. He bowed to the ground and he worshiped. And this can mean to not just bow, but to prostrate himself before the Lord. But it's all speaking about worship. So when we see the character of God, God who is willing to forgive, but God who is also punishes sin. Why? He's holy. He's righteous. And when Moses understands, sees, experienced, was taught the attributes of God, what did he do? He worshiped God. And the primary reason why we worship God is because he's worthy of worship. It's not what God has to do that, that causes us to worship. That he has to do this or do that, then I'll worship him. No. What he does should bring about worship in our life. But who he is, first and foremost, that provides the sheer foundation for our responsibility to worship him. And Moses demonstrates this. On Mount Sinai now I also want us to see the correlation between the giving of the commandments and worship if we want to understand worship the commandments of God having been illuminated by the Spirit of God being a new creation these commandments can be utilized to tell us how to worship God how we live faithfully before him verse 9 Moses is speaking and he says, If please I have found grace in your eyes, O Lord. Go please, O Lord, in our midst. Now, here again, what this is teaching us, remember the context, what's happening. It's the giving of the commandments. And when we rightly receive the truth of the commandments, the intent, the spirituality, the re relevance of the law. It is an invitation that God would go before us and into our midst. So if we want that experience of God's presence in our life, now he's there by salvation, but if we want to experience that and benefit from that, we need to see the commandments play a role in empowering us through the presence of God. So Moses says, if please or since I have found grace in your eyes, O Lord, may the Lord go please into our midst. Why does this need to be? Because it's only when God enters into us are we going to be changed. And notice here, we see that all of this is happening after redemption. What do I mean by that? After the blood of the lamb was put upon those doorposts and the exodus which parallels redemption takes place. And that's why when we study God's word and see the paradigms that teach us so much, we see redemption comes first. And now after redemption comes this change with God going into their midst. Redemption a salvation experience brings about regeneration. The people of Israel were not a new people. That is that God dwelt in their midst and this caused them to be redeemed. That is a false teaching. That is one of the primary problems with Calvinism, Reformed theology. They get it backwards. Look at the paradigms throughout the scripture. Verse 9, Moses is speaking. Since, please, I have found grace in your eyes, O Lord. May, may the Lord go, or literally, he will go, into our midst. Why do we need that? To change, because a, a stiff-necked people is he, meaning Am Israel, the people of Israel. Stiff-necked. And it's only God coming into our midst that's going to bring about a change. And this is true first for the Jew and also for the Gentile. All people tend to be prideful. And where it says in this passage of scripture, Keshe Orif, it is a reference to stiff neck meaning, and we talked about this, an inability to humble. Humble oneself, why? 
because of the disease of pride. And God coming into our life, us being prepared to receive Him by grace brings about a change. He says at the end of verse 9, You forgive our iniquity and our sin and, and I love this, inherit us. We want God to inherit us. That we might be His possession. And this is what we find. I mean, clearly, this passage of Scripture has so much spiritual insight for us at Mount Sinai. The giving of the commandments. And Moses is saying, we're prideful. We need you to come into our midst. We need forgiveness of our sin and iniquity and transgression. And we want you, O oh God, to take possession of us. Inherit us. Allow us to be your inheritance. Verse 10. And he said, Behold. Now, who's speaking now? God is. This is beginning in verse 10. We have God's response to Moses' petition. What Moses is requesting. And he says, God is speaking. Behold, I am cutting. And here's a good example of, and I've shared this with other groups, whenever the Hebrew present tense or if you can you may call it a participle there's a difference between rabbinical scholars how they term this this grammatical construction and how christian scholars term it the term is not important it's recognizing it and when we recognize this construction it always emphasizes it marks something as highly significant and what is God saying that's highly significant? Verse 10. Behold, I am cutting a covenant. Now your Bible may say making a covenant, but in Hebrew, you cannot make a covenant. You have to cut a covenant. He says, behold, I am making a covenant before all your people. Now this signifies... Through redemption, we become the people of God. And God is saying here, and I will, will make wonders which have not been created in all the earth among all the nations. Now, here again, I would underscore verse 10. Let's go back. God is speaking, and he says, Behold, I am cutting a covenant before all your people. Who's your people? It's Israel. It's the people of Moses. But through this experience, they become the inheritance of God. And God says, I will do wonders. What a great word. By means of this Sinai covenant, the commandments of God, being utilized properly, applied its relevance to our life. It brings about the wondrous activity of God. He says, I will do wonders which have not been created. Something new. Something special. That have not been created in all the earth and among all the nations. And, and see all this people who you are in its midst. Now, what he's saying here is this is coming about because you, and understand the, the imagery here. It's very, very important. Moses is seen as the first redeemer. And through Moses' leadership, the people are going to be recipients of the law. And that brings about intimacy with God, and the wonders of God in their life. Now that is a paradigm for seeing that the second Redeemer, the real Redeemer, both physically and spiritual, the ultimate one, Messiah. We find that through His redemption, that He is in our midst, and we see even a greater outcome. The work of the Lord for 
He is awesome. Now, look at this very carefully. The work of the Lord for awesome is He. And it's unclear because the word Mase is masculine. And Hashem, the Lord, is masculine. Are we referring to the work of the Lord, which is awesome? Or are we referring to God Himself? Both are true. Sometimes uncertainty is for a reason to say both. It's not an either or, but both. He says, which I, and once again, it's in that participle, that present tense, the one that marks it for significance, which I am doing with you. Here again, if your Bible says something else, I will do, no, I am doing at that time. Why is it in the present because it's telling us. It's trying to show the reader that, that this Mount Sinai experience has implications, powerful implications. So God is what he's saying he will do. It's beginning there. It's tied to this giving of the law, this receiving of the law. Verse 11. God continues to speak and he says, Guard yourself of what I am commanding you this day. Here's that same emphasis, lishmor, guard. And when this word appears, we should think of value. Guard that which is valuable. And the revelation here is extremely spiritually valuable. It brings about the will of God, the wonder of God the power of God, the presence of God among the people. If you study this on your own, you're going to see as you pray through this passage, much more than we're able to share now, of God's glory, His power, and the wonders that He wants to bring out through the relevance of His truth, the commandments of His words. So He says, you keep what I am commanding you today. Behold, and notice this, it is when we guard the truth of God that we value God's expectations, not ours, His expectations, that He goes to work against the enemy. Verse, verse 11, Behold, I am casting out before you. Realize this promise is all at Mount Sinai. I am casting out before you the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jezbesite. All of this, these six people. And how's he doing it? Six relates to grace. He says, guard yourself. Lest, and he says, don't do this. Watch out. Take heed. Don't do this. This is a valuable statement, in other words. Lest you cut a covenant with the dweller. Of the land meaning the land of Canaan that land of inheritance don't make any covenantal agreement with them he says that you're coming unto it that you're coming to this land less it will be a snare and this word in modern Hebrew is like a landmine Mokesh we know if we step on that what happens an explosion it is destructive and when we think we can have a covenantal relationship with those who do not believe in the God of Israel, we're mistaken. We need to remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. What fellowship can there be between good and evil? So he says, do not make a covenant with the one who dwells in the land, which you are coming unto it, lest it will be a snare, a landmine in your midst. Verse 13. For what should we do? Come into the land where these six nations and other, where, other places we learn there's even more. Where these nations dwell. And we go to war. Now Moses, he led the people up to the entrance. But it was Joshua. I think that's so significant, that name. Yeshua that led the people in victory over the enemy. 
and we see what they are to do. For, he says, verse 13, for their altars you shall uproot. It's a word for uprooting and destruction. And there, and this is where pillars or sacred places, their sacred monuments, however you want to translate this word, matseva. It says here, you shall break. And the asherahs, this is uh, wood, the trees that were made or used for making different idols. They were worship as well. He says, you cut them down. Four, do not bow down to another God. For the Lord, jealousy is his name. For jealous is he. And the jealous God, when we play the harlot, when we give attention to the things that we ought not, those things that are in conflict with the commandments of God, God's jealousy manifests itself in an in unpleasant way in our life. Verse 15. Lest, this is the second time, lest you cut a covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You do this, you make an agreement. And that's why, don't get all excited about Israel making a treaty, an agreement with another nation. Now, here again, it's not the people of this land, but they ought not. Let your yes be yes, your no, no. We, we shouldn't have to, and this is what's taking place, we shouldn't give the enemy weapons and, and disobey what the Word of God says in order to have an agreement with that with them. When we do that, bad things are going to happen. So he says, lest you cut a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. And it says, and you play the harlot after their gods. So if you do that, you will find yourself in idolatry, sacrificing to their gods. And notice, and, and it's speaking about this false gods, that a false god will proclaim to you and you will eat from its sacrifices. Now, I highlighted those, those words at the end of verse 15, that he will call to you this false god. Now, wait a second, you say. False gods can't speak. They can't walk. They don't see. They don't hear. They have a mouth, but they cannot talk. That's true. Now, what I'm saying is not in conflict with that. We need to see the underlying message of this text. There are no power to idols. But when we recognize an idol, a false god, it brings demonic activity into our life. And that's why people have all the time spiritual supernatural experiences in idolatrous practices. Why? It's not that idol of wood or stone or some precious metal that is speaking. But when you bow down to that, it, it emboldens the demon. And he speaks, and that's what this is referring to here. And you will eat, partake from its altar. Verse 16. And what's the outcome? You, you bring corruption into the next generation. That you take from his daughters for your sons. You intermarry. And in doing so, your daughters will play the harlot. They'll be involved in idolatry after their gods and will play the the harlot, that is, also will practice idolatry, your sons after their gods. Verse 17. Now what he's saying is, when we enter into an unrighteous, an improper agreement with a non-believer, and it has spiritual connections, 
everything has spiritual connections. It will produce in our life demonic activity. We need to guard the agreements we make. And with who we make them to. Well, let's conclude. Last verse. Verse 17. What's he speaking about? This idolatry, this adultery, spiritually speaking. And gods of, of casting molten gods, in other words. Do not make for yourself. Simply saying here, when we allow the influence of others, non-believers, pagans, into our life, into our sphere of influence, it is always going to have a negative outcome. So molten gods, those which we construct, we make, he says, do not make them. Do not do such a thing. And we see, and I'll close with this, the strong correlation between the commandments of God safeguarding us against idolatry. And what I would warn you of, and I believe that you can discern this for yourselves, when a congregation of believers, they turn away from the instruction of the commandments, all the commandments, but especially the law of God. When a congregation says, there's no relevance to that anymore. That's of the past. That's not for us. That's for the Jewish people, not for us. When a congregation, a local assembly has that view, I can promise you that their worship is going to move towards corruption. It is going to move towards the things of the world and manifest the ways of the world, the practices of the nations, rather than reflect the holiness of the attributes of God. That is the truth of this passage. Well, I'll close with that. Until next week, shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.